Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this is kind of an impromptu video and a uh, presumptive response to uh, out and out lie that will probably be coming tomorrow when someone sobers up. Uh, I had to toss someone from a live stream that was drunk as usual uh, and trolling and uh, after the fact, of course, there's an expose. It's the drama childishness that we see. But no, I do not deny original sin or edemic sin. I simply believe in original, original sin. Prior to Augustine, in his view, being... Uh, introduced into the body of Christ uh, many hundreds of years later, uh, which also incorporated original guilt passed on from father to son. That is uh, Calvinistic, all the way back to Calvinistic uh, seed spread into the body of Christ by Augustine himself, a former Gnostic who came into Christianity after he found out that he could allegorize much of the Old Testament. He didn't like the judgy part of God, of God, the mean version of God, something that you see kind of held to by many Calvinists today that just don't like to deal with the holy or the just aspect of, of God. Anyway, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to show you a clip from uh, Dr. Ken Wilson. He's one of the foremost scholars in dealing with Augustine, Augustine's belief system, his path into uh, his brand of Christianity after he stepped out of Gnosticism. I also... Uh, plug a few channels that will help you understand how much Calvinism is actually stuck in here, there, and yonder that you may not even be aware of. Uh, Beyond the Fundamentals by Brother Kevin. He deals a lot with Calvinism, Soteriology 101. Uh, Light and Flowers is where I'm pulling this clip from. He had Dr. Ken Wilson on who, like I said, wrote an extensive academic work that you can find on Amazon. You've got the really smarty smart version because he's like a hand doctor, super intelligent guy. And then a uh, more simplified version. If you'll search out Ken Wilson, Augustine, or um, you'll probably find it. If I can remember to find a link to put in to where the book is i will if not it's easy to find i'll also try to remember to post the video that i'm going to pull a clip from so you can watch it in its entirety and if you'll type out ken wilson and soteriology 101 they actually met several times to discuss augustine's effect on christianity that many people may not even be aware of but as far as original sin edemic sin i absolutely concur that there was original sin that that original sin had consequence that original sin brought a curse on mankind that original sin affected our very nature the fact that we were separated from god and out of the garden even Bob Wilkins actually touches, if you uh, search out enough of Bob stuff, that Adam and Eve had not received eternal life yet. There was no need for it. Their mortality was not an issue. Physical death would not have happened uh, prior to sin. Many hundreds of years later, Adam died, just like he was told if he sinned. I believe that our moral compass is skewed. We have a propensity or a tendency to sin. However, I do not believe that you are guilty for Adam's sin. You are affected. 
And I'll give you an analogy, and then I'll play the video clip to show you this idea of original guilt came into Christianity through Augustine, his brand of uh, Manichaean Gnosticism. He kind of imported it from, you know, their very deterministic, uh, deterministic in their thought, fatalistic, just like you see in modern Calvinism, gives people a perfect excuse why to act carnal. If you want to be a drunk, it's Adam's fault. If you want to be a prostitute, it's Adam's fault. If you want to beat your wife, whatever you want to do, it's fine. It's Adam's fault. You can't do no better. You see how Augustine provided the perfect excuse why you are not accountable for your sins, your actions. And here's the short analogy. Say you deal or you meet a prostitute. That prostitute has became pregnant illicitly through much fornication and whoredom. During the process, she became hooked on drugs. Her physical nature has been tainted. That same prostitute contracts AIDS. She gives birth to that child. If you hold to Augustine's original sin view, you would have to conclude that child is guilty for the mother's sin. Intuitively, makes no sense. Reasonably, makes no sense. Logically, makes no sense. But Calvinism makes no sense. That child, however, my view of, of original sin, that child is cursed. That child is terribly affected for its whole life. Its future, uncertain. That baby contracts AIDS from her mother's sin. That baby is born a drug addict because of her mother's sin. Her nature is tainted. That's what I see in scripture. That's what another brother that just reached out to me, I won't quote his name, but he's one that you know and love. He said it's just he doesn't understand the Augustinian view of imputed guilt. Intuitively, it makes no sense. We inherited a nature, a corrupted nature from our forefathers, not his guilt. So no, I do not deny Adamic sin. I do, however, deny the Augustinian original guilt concept. And it makes no sense what you read in Scripture. And I'll read from Ezekiel. I'll read from Romans 5, which they'll, they'll try to use as their justification and put like a, 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 a spin on Romans 5, but they won't read to you from Romans 7. So I'll read to you from Romans 7 right after the clip gets done. We'll look at some scripture. So no, folks, if you kick a drunk out of your live chat, they'll do anything to try and get back at you. If you try to enforce the Bible and its mandates and behavioral guidelines for believers in a fellowship, or you don't make an excuse for everything in the world, people's, they're going to get mad at you. That's just the way people are. And the more carnal they are, the more they're in this world, the more they do that. So with that, I will play the clip, and then we'll come back. Uh, exactly. Uh, baptism yeah. versus credo baptism? Yeah, you're right on. Um, so in the early days, of even as early as 200, Tertullian said, why are we baptizing infants? Why don't we wait until they're old enough to believe? And so there was baptism that happened, we know, very early, but nobody knew why. Even Augustine, about 400, did not know why infants were baptized. But what happens is, in 412, he gets into argument with Pelagius over infant baptism. Uh, and so he says, wait a minute, um, you have two infants. One is a baby who is born on the street by a prostitute. The other is a baby born of Christian parents. They're both sick. The Christian parents rush to the baptismal font. They don't make it. The baby dies in the arms of the bishop before it's baptized, and that baby goes to hell. The other baby from the prostitute is rushed in by a virgin. It's baptized, and that baby's saved. 
Of course, they believe that actually putting the baby in the water in the baptismal font was salvific. They received the Holy Spirit at that point. And so he said, what's the difference between the two? It can only be the providence of God. That God decides whether a baby is saved or not saved on based on whether that baby gets to the font, and he's the one who controls the circumstances. Therefore, it's not the human will that can save you. It only appeals for good or only avails for evil. So God is the one who decides it has nothing to do with the human person. And that's the way he justified his argument was through infant baptism. Huh. So um, the, the debate wasn't really about so much about Calvinism, Arminianism, as we know it today, obviously, because that's obviously acronistic in the sense that that's not until years later, obviously, but the whole debate that we have with Tulip, uh, sociology, um, that's not really what Pelagius and Augustine originally were debating. They were really dealing with the issue of uh, corruption of the, of the nature of the child from birth um, right. and, and what to do with the corrupt nature and whether you baptize them or not. So it, it seems to me Pelagius, therefore, regardless of what we think about Pelagius today or what we believed, he was actually siding with many of us who hold to credo baptism today or to, uh, to uh, baptism of believers today, uh, it seems to me Pel Pelagius was actually defending that perspective against Augustine's view of, uh, you know, baptismal regeneration of infants. Um, exactly. Okay. So and, and You're exactly ahead. right. And so Augustine's the one that came up with baptismal regeneration, that that is salvific for them. Nobody else before then really articulated that way. And everybody believed in original sin. I mean, the dissertation goes through that. They believed in original sin as physical death, a sin propensity, and a weakened uh, moral sense. So what was added was the guilt, that it was damnable guilt at being born from Adam. And Augustine is the one who added that. And so you're right, Pelagius didn't understand... Uh, the, the baby being born as damned, he thought that they went to heaven because they had not sinned. Uh, and so everybody else believed that too. He, he had some other issues, but at least he was right on that, that aspect. And so when Augustine added the guilt of original sin, that's when people started uh, <laughs> complaining and saying, wait a minute, um, there's a problem here. Right. So, yeah, and we, we obviously talked about that before on our program as well. Um, Adam Harwood's book, I think, does a really good job of explaining Dr. Adam Harwood from New Orleans, for those that want to look for that. Um, and he speaks of the, the natural condition from birth of a child. Though uh, sin stained, as you mentioned, under the curse of sin and the environment of sin, uh, not guilty for the sins of our parents, as it says in Ezekiel and so many other passages, that we're not held accountable or guilty for something that um, our parents have done, or our greatest grandparent did, but instead, as intuitively would be, I think, uh, accepted, that we would be held guilty for our own choices, uh, be accountable for our own um, decisions, not the decisions of, of those who've gone before us. Um, and so, Augustine, historically, is the first one to really articulate this concept of original guilt um, with the concept of that we, we are born guilty because of what Adam does. Um, and I've often made this argument, and correct me if this is, is, is right on, in the right direction here, but when, when a Calvinist says, or a theistic determinist, whatever you want to call the, the label there, um, when they say a, a man is responsible for his choices, what they, what they really mean is that they are not able to respond willingly, but they are still culpable because of the imputed guilt of Adam. And so I've always tried to point this out because they'll use the same vocabulary but mean have a different dictionary. They mean something different by the word responsible or culpable than we do. So when I say a, a person is culpable for their sins or responsible for the sins, I actually mean they are able to give an account for their actions. They are um, of an age where they can give an account. They are responsible, which means they're, they have the ability to respond willingly or unwillingly to God's appeals. Um, and therefore, they're held responsible for their choices. That's what I mean by it. And that's what most people generally speaking, intuitively, would think of the word as responsible. But yes. when an, an, an Augustinian, as taught by uh, him later in his life, uh, or a Calvinist, says, well, no, 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 Leighton, we believe men are responsible too. They don't mean that. What they mean is that men can't respond willingly or positively to God's offers, but they're still culpable or held guilty because of the imputed guilt from Adam's decision in the garden. Would that be an accurate assessment? Exactly, Leighton. 
and, and that's the Manichaean view. Uh, it came right out of Manichaeism. That's not a Christian view. And Augustine, with his 10 years, picked that up and brought it into Christianity to fight the plague. Now, I've often argued that Pelagius is kind of become the boogeyman of of the deterministic uh, you know line of Christian thought. In other words, uh, those who have kind of lined up with Augustine have done a really good job at painting all of us uh, in the really bad really bad light. Maybe even maligning a little bit of what uh, Pelagius himself taught, um, yeah. it, based upon some of the readings I have uh, from him. Um, he does say that we need divine aid, that we need help of God and, 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 and several of his teachings. And so um, I've always been taught that Pelagius believed that he was, we were born good and without any problem. We don't need any of God's help and that we can do all these good things. But reading Pelagius, he, he never, at least from what I read, he never said that. And it seems as if the common practice of that day is if somebody was deemed a heretic or uh, whatever they would, they would often burn you and your your writings, and so much of what we have from Pelagius didn't survive, um, and so it, it, he seemed to become this boogeyman, almost like Hitler is a boogeyman. He's a bad yeah. character, and yeah. so like in the political world, if I can link Donald Trump to Hitler, if I can link Barack Obama to Hitler, then I can make a case. Look, that guy said something that Hitler said once. He's a bad character, and yeah. we can do the same thing to. Pelagius. We can say, look at what Pelagius believed. He was a bad character. And those dirty Arminians or those dirty provisionists or those Southern Baptist traditionals, those grace guys over there, those 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 guys are teaching things that sound a lot like what Pelagius taught. Therefore, they're Pelagian or they're semi-Pelagian, if nothing else. They're boogeymen. Could we not turn that around? I mean, legitimately, could we not, if we were practicing the same principle, could we not call them semi-gnostics? I mean, by that same standard. I mean. Oh yeah, no, that's right, Layden, and you're exactly right on Plagueis. The the writings we have do support what you said, uh, having read them, and I point that out in my uh, dissertation. I also show that Augustine maligned him. He was the first one to make false accusations against him. Uh, in his, he was a polemicist and a rhetorician more than a student of scripture. He admitted that himself to Jerome. So you have a man who's attacking Pelagius. There's a great book out called The Myth of Pelagianism uh, by Bonner. came out last year and discusses that whole issue. Uh, expert, uh, just a, a great book. Now, is it true that uh, uh, Augustine was from Africa? Yes, North Africa. North yeah. Africa, and he did not know Greek. That's correct. He, uh, matter, matter, if, if what I, I remember reading something about him having a really bad experience with a Greek teacher I think he was abused by his Greek teacher or something, and so he just he kind of just wrote it off. I don't want to have anything to do with Greek anymore. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting if you read through his works, you can see where he just starts picking up a little Greek, and then he tries to insert some things. Uh, but it was after he he switched to his deterministic theology that he started learning Greek. So he'd already made his move by the time he he started to try to learn Greek. Huh. Okay. Do you think that can impact? I mean, obviously. I, I believe in it, it can impact when you don't know the original languages or the culture. And a lot of people yeah. don't realize 300 to 400 years after the writings of the New Testament, that's a long time. Um, three, 400, three or 400 years ago here where I'm sitting, I would have probably been surrounded by Cherokee Indians. Okay, yeah. You think about how much has changed in the state of Texas in the last three to 400 years. Think about how much changed from the time that Jesus walked the face of the earth and the apostles wrote the New Testament, and when Augustine, a Manichaean, former Manichaean Gnostic from North Africa, who did not know Greek, came in for the very first time, and by John Calvin's own admission, taught something that was unique and new to the early uh, church fathers. Um, yes, and, and not just Calvin, but most modern uh, Reformed theologians who are uh, our academic understand that they understand that Augustine is the one who introduced that into Christianity. Uh, it's very interesting that if you look at patristics, there's a book on original sin, and it says the patristic period, and it starts starts with Augustine. <laughs> Wait a minute, there are 300 years before Augustine. What happened to them? They all taught original sin, but it wasn't the same original sin. So it's rather humorous the way it's presented. We're right. All right, and so as you see from a very smart, Jesus-trusting, Bible-studying, 
incredibly smart person. Original sin, the debate is not, was there original sin? The early church and many well-respected forefathers confirmed original sin that it put us under a curse, that we were born in sin. This creation groans because of sin's effect. We ourselves groan because of sin's effect. In iniquity, we were formed. A sin environment all around us. Death, mortal death, mortality is something everyone faces. Everyone faces death if they're in Adam. You see, the, the thing about Romans 5 that they'll try to... Uh, not really point out is read scripture slow death reigned from adam to moses even over them that had not sinned over the similitude of adam's transgression so death physical death reigned people were born people lived in an environment of sin, people died. People being charged, made accountable for their own sins. However, the judgment that came upon all men was the curse. Therefore, as the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, mortality, separation from God, uh, being dead or lost, separated from God. Our sins and trespasses are something we're in. Guilt was not applied to us. This is the natural consequence of the curse itself. Now they'll talk about in Adam I'll die. How condemnation come on all men. Death passing upon all men. All have sinned. How by Romans 5.12 As by one man sin entered into the world. We see the very first original sin. And death, by sin, consequence of death, mortality. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Every person was born, every person sinned, every person died. The wages of sin being death. Do you know of one person who was born who didn't sin, but died in our place. Jesus Christ. One day he will completely rectify, reform, make anew in Garden of, e Garden of Eden type conditions, a world without sin or death. But we are all guilty for our own sins. See, Romans is not just chapter 5. <clears throat> Romans is also chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. What does Romans chapter 3, verse 10 say? As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. What does Romans chapter 3 say? For all have sinned. Not all are bearing the guilt of Adam's sin, 
no more than the crack baby is bearing the guilt of the crack prostitute mother that brought a curse for her sin upon her child. It's intuitive. I've talked to several other brothers tonight. It's it's just intuitive. You would have to, to fall into Calvinism in some sense to really be able to digest the thought that God is imputing guilt to you for what Adam did. Now, did our greatest grandfather put us in this position as far as a sin-fallen world? His sin got the ball rolling? Yes, that's what the Bible says. Was Cain guilty? Do you see anything in the text about Cain being guilty for Adam's sin? Or do you see Cain being guilty for Cain's decision, Cain's choice to sin and slay his brother? What was he punished for? Adam's sin? What was he guilty of? Adam's sin or his own? Intuitively, you know the truth. And if you've adopted this idea of imputed guilt, as you see in the video, that comes from Augustine. The church did not have this issue prior to Augustine. They were fighting then like they are now over this fatalistic, deterministic, Gnostic kind of idea of imputed guilt as to whether or not to baptize babies because some thought you had to be baptized in the regeneration process. Not a lot different than what you see right now. But many never fell into Augustine's version of original sin. And the fact that it excludes you of all true responsibility for your sin. You can do just like Adam did. Well, Adam... Well, Lord, Adam, that you made. Do you see the attempt of Adam to try and pass the responsibility of his own decision onto someone else? It didn't hold water. Because what you won't see is them take you from Romans chapter 5 where they'll pull that one idea out and they won't discuss these other things. That's what the Calvinists do. They won't take you to Romans 7. Let's see when the Apostle Paul, Apostle Paul, I think he understood the Bible as God was speaking through Paul. When did Paul say that he died? Was he stillborn? Bearing the guilt of Adam, you don't see that in the text. Romans chapter 7, what shall I say then, is the law sin? God forbid, the law isn't sin, God forbid. Nay, I had not known or understood sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taken occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead, powerless. For I was alive. I, what did Paul say? I was stillborn, for I was stillborn and I died a, a second time. He says, for I was alive once. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived. So sin gained power. It was no longer dead. Sin came to life. And I died. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Does it sound like he was stillborn in Adam's guilt? Tainted, 
Yes. Imperfect? Absolutely. Warped moral compass? Yes. Flawed nature? Absolutely. Guilty of Adam's sin? You don't see that in Scripture. I know many hold to it. And as you've seen, Augustine is who you can thank for holding to that view. For sin taken occasion by the commandment deceived me. And by it slew me. You can't be killed unless you're alive. You can't die unless you're alive in this sense. Just doesn't make any sense. You see, the Augustinian view just makes the scripture make no sense. And it does give you a perfect excuse to be a drunk. It gives you a perfect excuse to do whatever you want because you have somebody perfect to blame other than yourself. But it's you that will stand before God and give account for your actions, what you have done in your body. For the unbeliever, the unbeliever will not stand in judgment for inherited guilt from Adam. He will stand in judgment for his judged by their works. Is that not exactly what the Bible says? You know, when you deal with trying to help people grow, if you see pastors get attacked all the time, and I am no way claiming to be a pastor, but anyone in the body of Christ, if you try to help somebody see what they're doing is their fault, they will lie, they will harass they will do anything in the world, play emotions, all this crazy junk to try and get away from it and try and call you all manner of things for Christ's sake if you're just trying to help them. And the more carnal they are, the more likely they are to lash out at you. And like I said, intuitively, Many think they hold to the original, original sin, but due to being around Calvinists, they don't really lay it out there as clear or people who, whose mind is warped by Calvinism and that's why they're stuck in their growth. But when you press them, you can find out easily like I did. I can think of four right off the top of my head, three brothers and a sister. They're like, no, you're not guilty for Adam's sin. You're guilty for your own. You're personally accountable. You're personally responsible, not only for your accepting or rejecting Jesus, but for what you do in your body. That's you. That's what justice is. You receiving what you have done. That's why these people's mind who is twisted with this view can't understand justice they can't understand growth they can't understand a lot of things because they got to keep the excuse for why they can do what they do and have a scapegoat being Adam read Ezekiel 18 and every other part of the passage or, or the, the Bible and the passage is simply as what they say. You'll never come to the conclusion that anyone is guilty for what Adam did. Let's see. We'll look at Ezekiel 18, for instance. As for his father, because he cruelly... Let's see. I'll back up one. Verse uh, 17 that hath taken off his hand from the poor, that hath not received usury nor increased, hath executed my judgments, hath walked in my statutes. He shall not die. He shall not die for the iniquity of his father. He shall surely live. As for his father, because he, uh, be, because he cruelly oppressed, spoiled his brother by violence, and did that which is not good among his people, lo, even he who, the father that did these things, shall die in his iniquity, yet 
say ye, Why? Doth not the Son bear the iniquity of the Father? When the Son hath done that which is lawful and right, and hath kept all my statutes, and hath done them, he shall surely live. The soul, the person, the individual, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The Son shall not bear the iniquity of the Father, neither shall the Father bear the iniquity of the Son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. It doesn't match Augustine's view, because the reason Augustine brought it in, it's a perfect excuse. It's from Gnosticism, it's from fatalistic determinism and Calvinists for hundreds of years have used it as a perfect excuse why to burn people at the stake why to stay and wallow in their sin so that others can wallow with them and everyone has Adam to blame instead of taking accountability for their own sin so when you see, we know some of the same people, when you see somebody known to be an alcoholic, drunk type person, lie, flat out lie, and say that I deny original sin or endemic sin, I've shown you that is a lie. I hold to the scriptural view. Adam's sin brought death into the world. All men face mortality. All men have a flawed nature. We inherited that. But all men are responsible for their own sin, their own choices, their own acceptance or rejection of the gospel. All men have the ability to believe or reject the offer. So I wanted to make this presumptive video. It's unfortunate I have to do this, but when you deal with drunks and people that just want to make any excuse for what they do, sometimes you have to. If you ever have a question, feel free to put it in the comment box. I'll be happy to address it, but as you see, no, I don't reject original sin. The Gnostic, fatalistic, deterministic view however of original sin that came in hundreds of years later and that Calvinists hold to I find it nowhere in scripture you can bend a few verses to kind of imply it but if you read the Bible in its entirety it'll never enter your mind so I hope this helps squash the lie before it starts and if it doesn't you have what I believe right here so you know, stand true to God's word and understand you are responsible for you, who you hang out with, what you do. Don't blame Adam. Don't try to blame anyone. Accept it. Go to God. Seek his will. And if people persecute you for standing by the word of God, Read the Bible. That's all they ever did to Jesus, the prophets, and the apostles because men love darkness. They love their sin rather than light. And they will ha happily drag you into the shadows if you let them. So take care, folks. Be careful. Be vigilant. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you and tell people how awesome Jesus is. Till next time, God bless.